All right. Thank you. Can everybody hear me loud and clear? All right, thank you. I must admit this is my very first presentation in English, so I'm a bit stressed. <laughs> but uh, I once attended the world-class training here in Bankstown, which learned that uh, with some breathing and visualization, stress levels might reduce. So uh, <laughs> here we go. So I'm here to present you a challenging case, uh, which highlights some of the challenges we encountered during our medical retrieval in remote Australia. I will tell you a little bit more about RFDS in Broken Hill, the area we work in about the typical workflow of a medical officer working at RFDS. I will go through the case with you, identify some challenges and draw some conclusions. RFDS tries to provide primary and emergency care in and around Broken Hill, covering a landmass of approximately 604,000 square kilometers. That's three times the UK. And I don't know if any fellow Belgians are zooming in, but it's 20 times the size of Belgium and it's about one twelfth of Australia. Huge area, but only 50,000 people live there. Most of them are from the far west health district of New South Wales. We cover a little bit of West Queensland, and we go once in a while to the northern side of South Australia. Often we are the first and the only medical team to arrive, as ambulances are of limited use in the area due to the distances. This is a picture I took from the plane. In our area, we don't speak in terms of towns and villages, but more in terms of farm stations. There are approximately a thousand farm stations in the area, and we have a map available indicating the flight time to reach the patient. It takes somewhere between half an hour and 1.5 hours to reach the patient. Using fixed wing, helicopters are, are of no use due to the distances, and that does not in, include takeoff time and aviation planning. We have two aircraft available, the Beechcraft King Air 200, which are fully ICU equipped and where we can do both primary and secondary retrievals. If somebody in our area has a medical problem, they can call the RFDS emergency line. Call comes in, is handled by our own operation center at base and then transferred to one of the medical officers who is at base and ready to fly in case and if necessary. Those medical calls can range from simple primary healthcare oriented problems to full emergencies requiring immediate, immediate retrieval. About 70% of the calls are from bush EDs that are like officially small EDs, but more like bungalow style um, sheds with some beds in and but fully equipped where a remote specialized nurse is taking care of the patient and um, handling the case with our supervision remotely over the camera. 30% of the calls come in from private properties. And a lot of those private properties, they have medical chests on their farm, a medical chest full of medication and drugs to be able to handle the case remotely, such as antibiotics, but as well adrenaline, morphine, and the green whistle if needed. So most of the cases we can actually handle remotely over the camera, but sometimes we need to fly out. And then we decide um, we're going to fly out. So our medical officers are involved in every step of the process. That's from triaging, handling the call. Um, Let's have that time. Sorry. So good luck. Wait. No worries. <laughs> so that's uh, every step of the process, including like handling the, the call, triaging, uh, giving first medical advice over the phone, then tasking ourselves planning aviation response and actual responding in the end. Everything, of course, in cooperation with ACC. In case one of the medical officers decides to fly out, there's always a backup doctor. We call him in our organization, the S4, and he can take over the remote consults while the medical officer on duty is flying out. So somewhere mid-July, a call came in from Mulungari Station. A small plane had crashed and the pilot was still alive, but trapped in his cabin. He was initially unconscious for about 15 minutes, regained consciousness, complaining of severe lower back pain and was clammy and sweaty. This is where Molangari station is. It is in the desert, far out. Although only 200 kilometers from the nearest ambulance station, Broken Hill, which is for our area quite near, 
It's 600 Ks from the nearest trauma center, which is Royal Adelaide Hospital. I was already flying out that day. I was in Adelaide with another patient, so the call was handled by my backup, the remote doctor S4, who, after giving first advice to Mulungari Station, involved ACC, and ACC decided to task two ambulances to the scene from Broken Hill. Estimated time of arrival, two hours, driving over mostly unsealed roads. Actually, at the same time, I was finishing my previous job on the tarmac in Adelaide, and my S4 called me and said the case was happening. And I started brainstorming with my pilot. Do we have a possibility to fly to Molongari station? Do we have enough hours, pilot hours to go? And can we actually land in the area of Molongari? We informed ACC that we were available, that we actually had just enough pilot hours to fly to the patient and then maybe fly him back to Adelaide. We would have stranded, but that's, yeah, for the patient, that's all right. Um, major challenge was uh, Mulungari itself. Mulungari is a farm with a sand strip, and the nearest official um, airport, like a tarmac airstrip, was Honeymoon Mine Site, which is 32 kilometers from the sea. So we made two plans. Um, plan A was to fly to the sand strip on Mulungari, and then try to set up artificial lighting. Because it was winter, it was 5.30 p.m., and the sun was setting around 6 p.m. So landing in the dark on a sand strip is impossible. We need additional lighting to uh, be able to land with fixed wing. So our pilots on the ground in Tarmac, together with some other pilots in Broken Hill, started brainstorming, contacting Mulungari Station, and checking with the farmers if there was a possibility to set up kerosene fires. Simply kerosene, put in a bin, set on fire, along the runway to help uh, the landing process. Plan B was simply to fly to Honeymoon Mine Site. The miners were contacted and they were willing to be standby and to drive us with a ute, with all our gear to uh, Mulungari to the scene of incident uh, over unsealed road. That would be, that would have taken somewhere more than half an hour because it was 32 k from the site. We took, off, we took off in Adelaide about 6 p.m., which was 45 minutes after the initial call. We left, as you can see on the, on the left picture, we left our medical student behind in Adelaide because he was weighing too much. Sorry for the harassment. Um, and while we were flying over Adelaide during sunsets, uh, other pilots from Broken Hill um, kept coordinating with the farmers in Mulungari Station to uh, set up the kerosene fires and to make the landing process as smooth as possible. They did um, a rule run as well to evacuate the landing strip from all kinds of animals, such as kangaroos, set up, the, set up the fires. We circled twice over Mulungari Station, identified that we were able to land and touch down at 7.15 p.m. We were taken to the site of incident, where the pilot, who was initially trapped, had been extricated by his fellow farmers. He didn't deteriorate in the meanwhile. He was still conscious and still complaining of severe lower back pain. The ambulances that departed from Broken Hill actually arrived 10 minutes before we arrived, and they immobilized the patient, put a teapot on, and handed him over to the retrieval team. Clinically, I saw a patient with a free airway patent immobilized using a stiff neck. He did not have any major breathing problems. He had a very painful, he had a very painful palpation on the left side. He was hemodynamically stable, well circulated. He had a teapot on, and I didn't see any obvious bleeding. He was GCS 15, pearl, but had severe numbness and paresthesia over the lower limbs. He could still wiggle his toes. I saw some bruising over the left lower quadrant. He had a very painful collarbone on the left side. He had a swollen left ankle. His skin was intact, and he was hypotherm at 34.5. In his previous history, I identified he had suffered from some depression and anxiety and was treated with acetylopram. EFAST was negative, gave him some pain relief, first some boluses of fentanyl and during in-flight, 2 times 25 of CAT. He was fully immobilized, his temperature was controlled, and we retrieved him to the RA, the nearest trauma center, with a quick crew switch in Broken Hill due to pilot hours. 
follow-up learners, he had a burst fracture of L4, which can be seen on the picture on the right side. There were fragments in the spinal canal with rotopulsion of the posterior wall. He had an epidural hematoma of L3 to S2, which caused severe canal stenosis and a coli equina syndrome. He underwent emergency surgery, decompressing the spine and the epidural hematoma, repairing the dural effect, and fixating the spine with an L4 corpectomy and a cage reconstruction. He had some other smaller spinal fractures, all treated conservatively. Some other injuries, retroperitoneal hematoma, a sternal body fracture with a small anterior mediastinal hematoma, multiple rib fractures on both sides, and a small pulmonary contusion, all treated conservatively. He had the left Weber C ankle fracture treated with ORF. As you can imagine, this created some challenges. Although from a medical retrieval point of view, this was not the most exciting case, for me, doing more than immobilizing and giving pain relief um, was necessary, but we can identify some operational challenges. Huge distances, 200 kilometers from the nearest ambulance station. Actually, for our area, that's still uh, very feasible. Um, but ca can you imagine that if a plane crash in New crashes in Newcastle, an ambulance would depart from Sydney? Mulungari was 600 case from the nearest trauma center. In our area, we have limited aeromedical assets available. There's only one aeromedical retrieval team for a day shift or for a night shift, and I was already on a job in Adelaide. There's one ICP crew in Broken Hill, which was available and which was tasked to the sea, driving two hours over unsealed roads. There's limited availability of other services, such as the fire department or SES. Fixed wing is terrifying slow. Although we fly quickly, it takes about an hour to take off, to do some aviation planning and to fuel up. Enough fuel to get where we want, but not too much so we can still take off on very short runways. And we're often limited due to pilot hours. Often we can do one job and then we exceed our pilot hours. But sometimes, such as in this case, it's extendable in case of clinical need with an extra two hours. In our area, we often suffer of difficult terrain access. We have a few official airports in the area with tarmac airstrips and artificial lighting, but most of the stations have sand strips, which make landing during daytime uh, possible, but difficult at nighttime. All of this together, um, I was already gone on an Adelaide job with limited pilot hours, the Mulungari station was only 200 k from the nearest ambulance station, so ACC decided with all of this together to task two ambulances to the scene, evacuate the patient to Broken Hill, which has a rural ED, evaluate, do what is necessary, and if possible, retrieve him with night team to Adelaide. But as I was uh, sooner um, available than expected from a previous job in Adelaide, we started brainstorming on the possibility to land in Mulungari directly and we had still just enough pilot hours to do it. To know if we can land somewhere, RFDS has over the years created the Aircraft Landing Areas Guide in cooperation with the local farm owners. There are approximately 350 approved landing strips. Some of them are official airports. Some of them are designated parts of highway. Most of them are sand strips on private property, which are yearly checked in cooperation with those farm owners. The standards such an airstrip should meet are defined by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority guidelines. It should be 50 meters wide, 900 meters long, clear of obstacles, and it should have sufficient lighting. On the right side, you see the file of Mulungari Station with all the specifics of their sand strip. Important to know is that at RFDS, we use the Beechcraft King Air 200 aircrafts, known for a very high performance, were able to land on very short strips with them, even in high temperatures when the air gets thinner and when performance of most aircrafts are strongly reduced. As said before, sufficient lighting is an issue. 
official airports have permanent artificial lighting, but those sand strips don't. Landing at night is therefore challenging. There is a possibility to install powered battery LED lights that the farm owners can dispose when there's an emergency, but they have been proven to be unreliable because the batteries quickly die if not maintained well. There's a possibility to install solar airfield lighting, but that's rather expensive. It's about $30,000 to install those, and most farms don't do it because those strips are used once or twice in a year for emergencies. Historically, wise toilet rolls soaked in diesel have been used, but in our specific case, they decided to put on kerosene lanterns, actually just kerosene put in bins, put on fire, and then some four-wheel drives lined up to indicate the start of the strip. While we were circling over Mulungari, the pilot was in continuous radio contact with the farmers on the ground using the radios of the four-wheel drives, and the farmers were providing him with continuous updates about wind direction and weather using Channel 13. A lot of those farmers actually have quite some specific aviation knowledge. Either they are able to fly themselves, or they are often used to work with people, farmers who are pilots, so they often have quite some knowledge. I was really impressed on that. So I conclude that this case highlights some of the operational difficulties of aeromedical retrieval in remote Australia. And planning of optimal emergency response can be quite challenging. It's sometimes very hard to know what the optimal way is to reach the patient, but as well to evacuate him to the best optimal care. It's important to know that RFDS has a very specific logistical knowledge of the area. Our pilots are often born and bred in the area. They know the local farmers often personally. They know what is possible and they can be of added value in aviation planning. Uh, it's, uh, so I can conclu conclude that primary retrievals during nighttime on said strips are possible. And this case has shown great teamwork between RFDS, ACC, Western Ops, and has facilitated fast aeromedical retrieval straight to a trauma center with direct positive impact on this patient's outcome, as his epidural hematoma has been drained fast. And we have avoided to drive him two hours on, over unsealed road to a rural ED, uh, which was not a trauma center. I uh, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Is the medical student still there? <laughs> we picked him up later. He was very happy. <laughs> One of the things that strikes me about this case is the tremendous sense of uh, community and help that you get from all the farmers. Exactly. And I just wonder, given that you know you said that the I just know the farmers sometimes personally, they were obviously crucial to get those kerosene lanterns going, but equally people are moving away from the rural areas. Farmers are going to become less frequent maybe and less plentiful. Um, how does the RFDS see their logistical plans going forward um, in the context of those um, potential problems? <laughs> It's important to know that that guide where we can land on is yearly checked with the farm owners. So they know what's possible and what's not possible. If they have less personnel who put up emergency systems, they are communicating that with RFDS. So it's indeed, like you said, RFDS has a very strong community feeling. They co like com continuously uh, communicate with the farmers to know what's possible and not. Uh, medical chest is another example. Those medical chests are continuously updated providing them with medication and drugs that is up to date. So um, community workers from RFDS are continuously working together in the area to provide the best optimal care. Um, Chris, I don't really know much about your um, decision tree between Adelaide and going back to Broken Hill for your trauma patients. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this patient had a had signs suggestive of spinal injury. In the absence of sort of subspecialty trauma surgery needs, when would you take someone injured in that location back to Broken Hill over flying longer distances to Adelaide? Sure. I think um, as soon as we suspect major injuries just because of the impact, it's already good to go to a trauma center. So um, hemodynamically, he was stable. He didn't show any obvious signs of, of big life-threatening injuries immediately, but he had a suspected spinal fracture, 
which is an indication to go to trauma center. If he would not have had the spinal fracture, like suspicion of spinal fracture, even then we would have taken him to Adelaide just because of the uh, severity of the trauma and the impact. Yeah, it's it's very difficult to sometimes make that decision because we uh, are often limited in pilot hours and we take away a valuable asset in the area. We only have one uh, medical team. And if we decide that that medical team goes to Adelaide, we lose coverage of a whole area. Um, but nevertheless, Broken Hill is quite limited in what they can do. So the decision to go to Adelaide is quite low. Um, just when you started, you were talking about like your workflow and like giving advice out over the phone, what can we manage locally, uh, what needs retrieving. That all sounds really challenging. And I just wondered how you found I don't know how much retrieval stuff you've done before and how you adapted into that system. It all sounds quite hard and quite a learning curve. It's incredible to be involved in every step of the process. I did quite some pre-hospital work out in Belgium, but then in an ambulance where you get tasked uh, to a scene by an operations center who's handling the case. And here it's all on you. You take the first call, you give advice over the phone while you with another phone try to involve ACC and to try to figure out how to get there. And um, that's very rewarding, but very challenging. Um, and I think just logical thinking and good, good clinical decision-making is the most important thing. Um, there's not much guidelines you can uh, follow or hide from. <laughs> um, it's just uh, logical thinking and trying to make to be the best for the patient. Yeah. And Christoph, I don't know whether you were aware, but there's, a, there's over 20 people joining us on Teams as well. So I'm just going to give them a moment um, to see if anyone online would like to ask any questions. Thank you so much, Christoph. Um, everyone, he's literally just landed in Sydney, got a taxi here um, and um, to be here in person. So we're very grateful. So thank you very much. And um, you spoke very eloquently and um, <laughs> very much highlighted the skill and knowledge of not just the medical team, but also the, the air crews as well, which um, uh, leads you to providing excellent care. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me.